we're shaped by you know our environment to some degree or another so I, I think for us you know we're very prideful of this corner of the world that we're from you know we have this kind of like prairie sort of like rural culture kind of you know ingrained in us a little bit um, and then being so close to the mountains they're, they're you know like that has its own aspect of like influence you know what I mean versus just being a you know like this this really rural place kind of no matter what where you're from ends up influencing what you sound like um, a lot of the time I think even in like unconscious or subconscious ways like I, I don't think everybody anybody sets out to be like oh I want to sound like I want to sound like Lethbridge or I want to sound like Prairies or whatever but it seems like uh, that when you live somewhere a lot of the time the, the music or a lot of the time my favorite music from places kind of takes on the tone of the surroundings. It's definitely not, it's a more creative city than I think it gets, uh, it gets credit for. There's a lot of different uh, artists, different artisans, uh, people who uh, have really sometimes obscure uh, businesses that are really, really interesting and you can meet so many diverse and, and interesting people around here. Um, Lethbridge is one of these areas that has a lot of hidden stories. Not many people know a lot of the history around here, including the people who live here. Uh, the biggest events in history are motivated by, motivated by sometimes the smallest people who aren't always caught up in the glamour of history. And I see a lot of that in my own family history with my great-great-grandmother, uh, my great-great-great-grandfather, uh, and a lot of uh, my ancestors who I'm grateful enough and, and I'm lucky enough to be able to read about uh, in family writings and even in some mainstream history books and stuff like that. It sounds cliche, but before you can understand where you're going and the legacy that you want and the vision you want to craft, you really have to understand where you've come from. It's very important to document the voices that, that are a part of history, not just the objects. I think it's more important in some ways to collect those voices and stories than it is to collect the object because without the voices and the stories it's just a camera it's just an accordion it's just a teacup and a bowl a pair of gloves no different from the ones that are in your house it's your voice and your story that make it important and make it important to your community that they can come back and they can share in these memories they can share in these moments and you can look to what's happening in the future and learn in some cases from what's happening in the future. To kind of represent like the heart behind like coffee as being the vehicle of connection, um, but the connection being the valuable thing. So the human connection is, is the thing that people really desire and need. We wanted to find an image or something to convey that and so we commissioned uh, Maddie to do a, a bunch of different drawings and she just created one day this this coffee plant image with a hand and it was very similar to like an olive branch motif which is just communicating connection and an offer of a relationship. There's an Agnes Varda quote that comes to mind where she says, um, if you open people up, you get landscapes. And her, in her experience, she said, if you open me up, uh, you get beaches. Well, I think if you opened me up, uh, you'd probably get prairies. <laughs> Lots of bands from the coast um, make really like lush, reverby, uh, just like rainy sounding music or whatever, and do a really nice job of that. And I, I find that. Most of my favorite records sound kind of dry and sound kind of um, like maybe a, a little bit like uh, harsh or rustic or like, um, yeah, I think just like the yellow tones and the brown tones of the landscape and the, the like dryness and harshness of the weather. To the ocean and back again like a passenger train. History 
doesn't have to be old. History is about what's happening today. It is what it, what's about happening yesterday, but it's also what's happening tomorrow. And when we forget about that, we forget about these incredible voices who are here now, who can tell their stories and be remembered and not be confined to just a chip in the street or it's something that it frustrates me greatly that we still think that museums have to be repositories for old stuff. They don't, and those voices are important. And it, well, with the accordion in general, one of the reasons why it resonated to me was, imagine if it had been collected when the original owner was still alive, the donor's grandfather. What stories would we have heard from him about playing? What would have been some of his favorite moments that he shared about playing at community gatherings or memories from playing with the Italian community on the north side or with the camera? what would have been some of the most memorable photographs he took. Those stories weren't thought to be collected at the time, uh, and it's quite difficult when sometimes you have children or descendants coming in and they don't know anything about the object. It's not often that you can actually almost feel history when you're holding it in your hands, but this is definitely one of those when you go looking in in the Lethbridge Herald archives as often as we do on staff here at the Galt. You can really you can really feel it and see it. And he was at the community events. He was not just at crime scenes. He did studio photography as well for locals. He was there when there was anything really important happening. He was there to take photos when some kid was having a birthday party down the block or going to a baseball game. He was out there for the community. And, and I think that was really important for the individuals who couldn't necessarily afford to go to a studio or Yeah, I remember, I remember I didn't know really, I wasn't good at sewing. So I bought this sewing machine and I bought it out at a farm and I had the lady that I bought it off of like run it through how to use it and sew. And we were in her place and I sewed two pieces of leather together and it was like, they just climbed Everest basically. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then we brought it back and started learning how to sew and work on the machine. And the, and the funny thing is that's what my grandfather did he, for a living was he worked on sewing machines and was sewing and I never really put the connection together that years later that we both used a sewing machine to make a living. My um, great grandfather on my mom's side was into leather and um, my mom and him used to, this was a wallet she made when she was like 18 or something. And when I got into leather, I remember asking my dad, you know, where do you buy leather or how do you, um, like, you know, where do you find tools to get into it? And he laughed and brought up this box and had a bunch of my mom's and her, her grandfather's leather tools. And so I had this cool little starting pack that was from my family, essentially. But on my, on my uh, father's side, he was the sewer. And so, um, you know, like I said, it took me years that my dad bought an industrial machine and he used to sew and he had his own little manufacturing hustle, uh, making these sort of slippers actually. We all essentially used a sewing machine at some point or another to make a living, which is like, I never really put that connection until way later in life. So it's, it's hard to say that it was necessarily like influenced by that, but maybe just inherently it was, but it didn't feel like, you know, Gramps was like, you need to sew for a living. Um, so it's kind of both sides of the family. The, my mom's side did a little bit of leather work. My mom did a little bit of leather work, again, just as a hobby. So I had a cool little starting pack to get going. Um, and then most of it was kind of most, everything else was pretty much self-taught. Just like figuring out what different machines um, did and do and where do you get them. And I'm just obsessed about it, the process. I think spaces that are just for connection are really important. I think what's really special about cafes and what we do is seeing how much um, interconnectedness happens in the community where like people that wouldn't have met, met each other have met each other and um, just the power of that. Um, kind of in a broader sense, like cafes are powerful because of the ideas that are shared within them and the connections that are made and um, how that holds a community. And it's really not about the coffee or the cafe, it's about the people. But I love the depth of it, I guess, or the, the, 
the complexity of coffee and I love how people focus it is on each part of the process, whether it's growing, picking, um, roasting, but then also how much um, it's just a, people are around that process, even in the cafe and just, it's very, it's very social. And I love that component of it. Suddenly there was all of these new people that we never ever would have run into, people that I would have never gotten the opportunity to know. And I could honestly think now and probably make a list of a hundred people that I never would have connected with who are now people that feel like family to me. And that's happened just completely organically because we, we met around the shop and we got to know people over time. And I feel like there's that sense of transparency with the kind of work people are doing or they actually want to let you in. And so I think as I was yeah, working there more full time and just my own journey over that time, I was amazed at how much more I wanted to be open and share my own story and my own heart with people. And then likewise, almost seeing that mirrored back in the city. Maybe it does require a sense of personal openness to kind of receive that in the city, but suddenly all of these like-minded people are around me and as I share my story, they want to share their stories. One of the things that I always find incredibly fascinating, and as I've come back to Lethbridge and really, uh, as we've gone through the transformation or started to go through the transformation that we're going through as an organization, I've really started to pay attention to the people who build communities. The reality of it is, the majority of the streets that we drive on or the pavilions that we're in or the, uh, the history tied to a place and the legacy tied to the individuals with that place is not known. In my opinion, I think a lot of times uh, the biggest events in history are motiv by, motivated by sometimes the smallest people who aren't always caught up in the glamour of history. And I see a lot of that in my own family history with my great-great-grandmother, who was a Métis pioneer, writing memoirs back in her day and uh, telling stories about that time period. Uh, that inspired people like my aunt to, my great-aunt to, write a book about her, about our great-great-grandmother, and um, uh, tell her story in a more modern time, which has inspired me today to also, as a filmmaker, take that inspiration and try and do my own, uh, do that in my own way. You know, if I think back to um, the kinds of stories I find myself attracted to, whether that's a story uh, like that, or whether that's a more modern Indigenous story. I just think there's a lot of uh, old, old uh, history, a lot of old stories that have been hidden for a long time, and um, I think that's an important thing as uh, creators to talk about. I think maybe uh, sometimes in in small towns, making music or making film or whatever is seen as uh, like a pipe dream or a hobby, kind of like. I don't know, maybe you're really into foosball or maybe you're like, uh, you know, whatever. You have like uh, mountain biking or stuff that you, you like to do. Uh, and you're seen as kind of like foolish maybe if, if you uh, say that that's what you're planning to do as a career. I guess for me, um, an, an important step has been uh, kind of forgetting about the, the career aspect and focusing on the work, like just saying with whatever tools I have, whatever finances, whatever friends, I'm just going to make something that feels valuable to me. I'm going to do my very best work uh, regardless. We're going to make it anyway. If we don't have any money, uh, you know, you can make a record with your cell phone or you can, you can make recordings uh, with, you know, no budget at all. You, you can still make stuff and so whatever you have access to, uh, just use it and make like the best, uh, most sincere uh, work and kind of pour yourself into it. And I think that there's uh, a sort of spirit of that in Lethbridge right now. I, th I think with Lethbridge specifically, um, you know, as far as creating that culture and honing, there, there's so many people doing amazing things. And I, I think over... Like we would like to collaborate and work with these people and showcase, you know, these people doing these amazing things, you know, from anything artistically, from music, crafting, making. Um, so working with these individuals is a big part of us. Like sharing, shared delight comes to mind. Like that's kind of a word I use in, in kind of our vocabulary, our language with the brand. You know, 
I get really inspired and fueled up by collaborating with other creatives, and and it inspires me, and I get feel you know. It, brings inspiration to what we do and, and just wants me to be better in our products and so for us to to do those collaborations and hone um, or, or create a space anyways that we can do that um, and that's kind of what this is a little bit about you know it's, it's just important I, I think sometimes you know being from here again there's just a lot of people doing a lot of great things and, and it's they're sort of overlooked and so you know for us we would really like to try to you know, share that stuff with our community and, and tell their story and, um, yeah, I don't know, really just, just share it, really. The branch for me is, it's entirely about the hand. And to me, it's, it's the hand that extends out, that offers something to someone else. And it, 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 the meaning it, to me has changed a lot, I think, over time, but I think the biggest thing in my heart right now in the city is actually about neighborliness. And it's something I've talked to our staff about and, and just thinking about what does it mean to be a neighbor, like true neighborliness. If we just impact the people directly around us, like the people we have contact with, like the places our hands can touch, I think that is so beautiful and it's so meaningful. And it, we offer, like, what's in that hand? What is it that you feel like you have to offer? Whether that's in your own relationships or if you go even broader to your own city or your own neighborhood. And if you're brave enough to offer what's in your own hand, I feel like it really can bring and be the bridge that brings connection and meaning to other people's stories in their life. And I think that's so beautiful.